of his ways. Hallelujah. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Yes, you are. Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand clap, clap of praise on this Wednesday night. On this tired old Wednesday night. How many of you are tired this evening? Last time I was this tired, I had COVID-19. I, uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a week already, but uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, get a little bit of the energy of the Lord into the room tonight. Amen. A little bit of that anointing flow. And I told my wife tonight, I said, I'm going to have to have some anointing tonight. I, I refuse to come to this pulpit without it but uh tonight i really need it and, and i know that that you need that anointing as well but before we get into the word of the lord i'd like to ask somebody very special uh sister mitzi to come up and testify for just a moment Sister Mitzi, God is going to see you through, going to see you through. It's uh, good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. If you would, turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And... Um, going to be a little bit different message tonight. This is definitely a Bible study message. It is a, uh, I would say that tonight's message, just to give you a little bit of a pretext to it, it is not inspiring. It is not inspiring, but it is very profound. And it is something that we need, especially during these times. And this thing's cutting out again. I need the other one. Thank you, Brother Bledsoe. I'd like to uh, say that uh, Brother Bledsoe is, and, and Brother Tim as well, they just uh, could not do what I do without them like to give both of them a hand. Amen. But my title tonight is called The Dividing Line, and it is a giant paradox. And, you know, people say, that, well, the Scripture disagrees with itself. No, it doesn't disagree with itself. There are paradoxes within the Scripture. There are mysteries within the Scripture but whenever you really explore them, whenever you find them out, then it all makes sense. And uh, so we're going to talk about one of those paradoxes tonight, the dividing line, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse, we'll start our reading at verse 12. This is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. But what I do that I, do, that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may uh, be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers, his ministers, Listen to that. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, uh, yet as a fool receive me, that thou may boast myself a little. 
that which I speak, boy, it's hard to read Paul sometimes, isn't it? But that which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in his uh, confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also, for ye suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you in the face. I speak as concerning repro reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? Question mark. So am I. Are they Israelites? Question mark. So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Uh, three times suffered, sh suffered shipwrecked. A night and day have I been in the deep. So, ready to be a Christian? So you want to be a Christian. If you're reading this, you're like, uh, no thanks. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by heathen. All these things you expect, right? In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. You may be seated. I would like to focus on the last statement. In perils of false brethren. Now, we talk, he just talked about that the ministers of Satan have transformed themselves to look like, to act like, to sound like ministers of God, and that Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He comes in disguise. How can that be that evil people, and we have people who come into the church, we have people who come into the church with evil intent, false brethren who seek to so discord among the true brethren. And so, but they come incognito. They come in disguise. So, we are to be very wise. It is difficult sometimes to tell the difference. It's difficult to tell the difference between a true brother and a false brother. But in this time, especially in this time, because of everything that we are going through currently and everything that we are going to go through in the future. And the mission, especially the mission that we're on. You know, I believe that if we weren't preaching the truth, we would probably never have false brethren. If, if matter, I mean, if, I guess if the pastor is a false brethren, I mean, that's, that you got a bad problem. But if, I truly believe that there are people who are dispatched, who are ministers of Satan, dispatched into the church. So it's very, very important because our mission, our mission, there's not a more important mission in the universe than the mission that we're on, which is to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, as you recall, whenever Moses got his instructions from God, and God came to him in the form of a burning bush, and he, he spoke with Moses. And he said to Moses, I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him to let my people go. And Moses, of course, was reluctant. I can definitely understand that. I can understand Moses' reluctance. Um, I had someone ask me one time, so how, and this was a very important person, uh, asked me, so how is it that a Sunday school teacher all of a sudden becomes a pastor? And I was like, don't ask me. This was not my plan. 
although I am glad that God chose this plan in my life, but it was not my plan. But Moses was reluctant, and as a matter of fact, God said, well, I'll tell you what, since you're reluctant, I'm going to give you some signs that whenever you go to Pharaoh, that you show him these signs and see what happens. And so he, uh, he said, throw your rod down. And whenever Moses threw his rod down, it turned into a serpent. He said, now pick your rod back up. So Moses picked his rod back up, and it turned back into a staff. It was a staff, actually, rather than a rod. So he, he picked up his staff, and it turned back into a stick. And then he said, put your hand in your coat. So he did. He said, pull it out. He pulled it out, and it was covered in leprosy, which is, was especially at that time very, very deadly. There was no treatment for leprosy at that time. And so... Uh, and then he said, put it back in. And so he put it back in, and he pulled it back out, and it was clean. He said, so whenever you go before Pharaoh, show him these signs. And so whenever he came before Pharaoh, he was going to go and say, hey, God told me to tell you, uh, stepbrother, by the way, that to let his people go, let the Jewish people go, free them. And so he went before Pharaoh. And, uh, and Pharaoh said, uh, how about no? <laughs> Just to put it in modern terminology, how about no? So Moses throws his staff down there. And then all the magicians that Pharaoh had, they threw their staffs down too, and they turned into snakes. They did the same thing that Moses did with his staff. And so I said that to say this, that everything, every authentic work of God, Satan has prepared very carefully a counterfeit. So we must be very, very aware of not only counterfeits on TV, not only counterfeits on the radio, but we must be very aware of counterfeits in our church. Because there, if, is, if there is any such thing as a true brethren, there is false brethren. And we need to be able to identify them. And that sometimes is a very difficult thing for a while. So, how can we tell the difference? How can we discern the difference between a true brethren and a false brother? Because these false brothers were giving... Even the Apostle Paul got snookered, apparently, by some false brethren. If he had known they were false brothers, he wouldn't have even let him, them close to him. Because he gives some instruction on false brethren. Okay, now, ultimately, have you ever met anyone, and I was asked this today, Billy, so if you're listening, and I know you are, from your home after having surgery, on the way back from the hospital today, we were having a conversation, and he asked me a question regarding this, and I said, you're not going to believe this, but I'm preaching about this tonight. And he said, we're on the same page, Pastor. So, Billy, this is for you. Have you ever met anyone that their words were incongruent with their actions? that they would sign the dotted line as far as being a member of the church and then stab you in the back with a pen as you walk away. In the book of James, he talks about a true brother, a true brother whenever you come before him and say, hey, I'm in need. I need some help here. James said that, you know what, uh, a true brother won't say, well, God bless you, go your way. A true brother will get in the trenches with you and will give you some help. He will do what he can to help you. And a false brother will say, well, God bless you, go your way, and then they'll badmouth you on your way out the door. So, 
we're going to talk about that for a little bit tonight because it's very, very important for us to discern. Now, if you have discernment of spirits, if you have, and that is a gift of the Spirit, just like the gift of healing, just like the gift of faith, like the gift of prophecy, like uh, the many, many of the other gifts, the, gifts uh, the gift of discernment of spirit is a very, very important gift to have. If you pray for any, if you don't have any gifts of the Spirit, pray for discernment. In my opinion, other than the gift of faith, discernment is the most important. That's just my opinion. The Bible doesn't declare which one is the most important, but I believe that discernment is very important. So if you don't have it, pray for it, and maybe God will give you some of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, he said it is his good pleasure to give his children gifts. And so pray for that one. If you don't pray for any more, pray for discernment so that whenever one of these false brethren approach you, you're going to know who they are. Now that's one way to know, but if you do not have the gift of discernment, I've got some other ways that you can identify them. Okay? Because it's very difficult, and this is something that as a, as a pastor over these past four years, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot, and I've got a lot to learn, but I've hurt, learned a whole lot about false brethren. I've learned a whole lot about folks who talk a good game, and so this is a little bit raw tonight, but it's a whole lot true. Christians are supposed to be nice to everybody, right? Be careful. Be careful. We are supposed to be kind to all men. We're supposed to be kind to strangers. We're supposed to be charitable to strangers because we may be entertaining angels. But there are some folks... And this flies in the face of, of the modern convention. I mean big time. Big time. This, this message today is a huge paradoxical message. And you're going to scratch your head and say, I don't know if I agree with him until I prove my point. There are some people that we are not to entreat. There are some people that we are not to even eat with that we are not to welcome into our home. There are some people that we are not to even greet and tell them Godspeed. There are some folks that you don't even need to say, have a good day. Because if they have a good day, you're going to have a bad one. And I'm going to tell you who they are. I will prove. A lot of you are saying, no, I don't agree with that. I'm going to prove. Like I said, don't believe me. That's okay. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm going to prove to you what I'm, what I'm saying. 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they the, wor they the world and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God hears us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There is indeed, and he's talking, whenever he is talking about that, he is talking about these workers of iniquity that masquerade as saints of God. And th this is actually where we got the terminology hypocrite. A hypocrite is not someone who messed up and sinned and came to church on Sunday. That's just somebody who needs some mercy. That's somebody who needs some grace. Now, if you don't turn away from your sin, you got some problems. 
But somebody who was found in sin, he just needs God's mercy, and he needs our mercy. But a hypocrite, a hypocrite is an actor. That's where they got the terminology. A hypocrite is someone who seems to be one thing and is something else. And the only place that you will find hypocrites is in the church. You say, well, I'm not going to the church. It has hypocrites. <laughs> well, every good church does. I don't know about the bad ones, but I know the devil dispatches hypocrites into good churches. So if you've got hypocrites in your church, go to that church. It's probably a good one. We're going to weed them out. Now, I have instruction by God that, you know, you, that you have wheat and tares, and you can't pull up the tares until harvest time. And then the master throws them in the fire. But try the spirits. What does this mean? If I were going to be tried today, if I got arrested <laughs> today by, by our in, I would like to say that I am big, big, big time in support of the boys in blue. Amen? Let's give them a hand clap. And the girls in blue. But if I were arrested today and I was put on trial and that I went to the stand and I said, I didn't do it. And the police officer said, I saw him do it. I put it in the report. Whatever it was I supposedly did, I saw him do it. And I was like, I didn't do it. Then the judge would have to figure out who was telling the truth. And I've seen a whole lot of people in the last four years in courtrooms that their words and their deeds did not match up. They were incongruent with each other. And that, those are the types of people that we're talking about tonight. John chapter 7, St. John chapter 7, in verse 24, says, Judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment. How do I judge righteous judgment? You can't look on the outside. Some of the most holy-looking folks are some of the biggest hypocrites. And then, I mean, you know, you find hypocrites that look every certain way. But a hypocrite, somebody who is dispatched to your church, is most definitely going to look above reproach. They're going to be the ones that look down at everybody else and say, well, that person's not quite as good as I am. And inside they are a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones, and they are dangerous. They are venomous people, and we must judge them righteously. Be careful when judging because uh, Scripture does say that when you judge, you're going to be judged as well. But we must judge. We must try the spirits. And those spirits don't walk in here by themselves. I've had a whole lot of trouble with a whole lot of people that have walked through these doors. But you know what? I have never had a demon come in here and give me a problem on his own. They walk in with people. You know, and some people are oppressed by demons and that's where you get your depression your anxiety that type of problem you have you have someone who for whatever reason they they have come in contact with something evil and it is kind of following them around come up here brother this is all right I'll walk over there I, I i'm just i'm not a demon i promise I'm just going to play one. Okay, now walk over there. Let's say walk over there by Hank. All right. Wherever he goes, I go. Hang on. Not done. 
Now that is oppression. That is a demon going with you. And he, wherever you go, he said, everything that might be positive, he's like, no, you're ugly. No, you're stupid. No, um, you know, this person's trying to rip you off. It, they, and people tell me, you know what, I, I, I'm just hearing negative voices. That's because you are, are under oppression. And you have a spirit that is following you, okay? That's easy enough to get rid of, easy enough to get rid of. There's another level of this. Now walk back over there to Hank. There's an attachment. There's a different level of experience with attachment. There's attachment. And, and it, he can't get away. I, wherever he goes, he is, he's held back because I'm with him everywhere he goes. And he's, he's trying to pull me, and he's lifting weights these days, so he's pretty stout. But, but everywhere I go, everywhere he goes, I'm attached to him. And you get that kind of folks walking in here too, okay? And then you get those folks who have invited demons into their life. Just like we invite the Holy Ghost into our soul, their souls are inhabited by evil spirits. And if you don't believe in this type of thing, you need to read your Bible. Because the Bible is full of oppression and, and attachment, and it is also full of demon possession. And so those things are as real as this table. And we have people that are trying to crawl in underneath. They're trying to slither in underneath the doors you know, people with oppression, welcome home. People with an attachment, even. We can get rid of that attachment. We can even cast that evil spirit out if you are possessed of it, if you're willing to relinquish it. I can't do it, but the one who inhabits me, like the Scripture just said, he that is in you is greater than he is in the world. And so we have the power by the very nature of the Holy Ghost to cast out those demons. Whether they are oppressing someone, whether they are attached to someone, or whether they are possessing them. But if someone, they have to let go of their demon. And so we, uh, we must discern and try the spirits of people, or, or, or the spirits that people have. Like I said, they can, be, they can be controlling them in several different ways. And so uh, how many of you have ever felt the influence of a demon? There's all kinds of them. Depression, addiction, uh, anger, rage, all kinds of different demons that can get on people. And so uh, those are as real as they can be. So. And these folks, the first place they want to go is to a good church. That's very ironic, isn't it? That's an ironic thing. But these folks, not all of them, the ones that are oppressed and depressed and things like that, they just need some help. The ones that have an attachment, a lot of times they don't really know what it is they're doing, although they can be very divisive in nature. Those that are possessed... They are under total control of evil spirits. They come. They enter into the church to distract, to divide, to sow division among the true brethren. Hey, you should hear what Scott said about you, even about your wife. And I know something about Scott that he doesn't want me to tell you. It has to do with ants. <laughs> you can't tell me anything, brother. <laughs> but these people masquerade as good folks. And they want to tear everybody else down. Let me tell you something. If you got somebody who just wants to criticize and tear people down... Beware that person. Romans 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. 
Avoid them. Stay away from those people. If they are sowing division, if, they are, if they're coming against the doctrine, if they're sowing division among the brethren, stay away from them. Shun those people. And I will tell you, that is so in the face of these modern fly-by-night doctrines that it's all-inclusive. Let me tell you something. Christianity is not all-inclusive. It is an exclusive club. It doesn't matter what color you are, what nationality you are, what language you speak. It doesn't matter. But it is exclusive to true believers and to true brethren. Second John chapter 1. Let me get there. This making any sense to you? We just have to be aware of these things in these times. Second John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness of in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and life in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And if, if the... Uh, Second, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, I read the wrong one. That's good, but I read the wrong one. Second John chapter 1, let's try that again. Verse 9. Okay. It says here, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine receive him not listen to this receive him not into your house neither bid him god speed for he that hath that biddeth him god speed is a partaker if you even greet them and wish them well you are a partaker of their evil deeds having many things to write unto you i would not write with paper and ink but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy be full. Now, he says, now, they're not just talking about sinners. Jesus himself, he dined with publicans and with sinners. Now, he didn't party with them. Everyone that he came in contact with, he changed. And that's what we're supposed to do. Whenever we Whenever we are at work and we are among sinners, we're not to be like them. We are to change them. We're to do everything that we can to change them, but that's not what who, who uh, Paul was talking about, or yes, who Paul was talking about here because he said, don't even let them in your house. Don't greet them. Now, that's not Christian-like. I didn't know that was in there. That's just not Christian-like, not to be nice to folks, not to eat with them, not to even say howdy. Kind of surprising. Titus chapter 3. Verse 8, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. It won't be very much longer. Maybe I can read the right verse this time. Titus chapter 3. 3 verse 8 sorry I'm so tired I can barely read it all I did go to Harmony Grove so that's the problem this is a faithful saying in these things I will that thou affirm constantly that thou which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works and works are important aren't they talked about that the other day that works are important these things are good and profitable unto men but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions if you at all can avoid contentions my goodness avoid contentions and strivings about the law 
for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Reject that man. Where have you heard that taught lately? Reject that man. Don't reject the sinner. But these false brethren, they're looking to subvert the truth. They're looking to subvert unity. That's harsh. But when we wish to be judged and found guilty, who wants to be found guilty? If you break bread with these people, you're guilty of their iniquity. That's why it's so important for us to know them. So important for us to discern them I don't preach like this very often, but I want to give you some other ways to identify them if you do not have the spirit of discernment, if you do not have the gift of discernment. I will tell you, and not everybody, you all know I'm not a big fan of technology. I mean, you know, a technology, I mean, I like driving my car, like driving my tractor. That's about as far as I go with technology. This here, I do not like it. But, and, and I know all of you love it, most of you. But false brethren love to use technology to destroy people. They like to use technology against the church. As a matter of fact, they like to use the church's own technology against it. And I will tell you, everyone listening out in TV land, if you want to go on our website and badmouth us, you will be blocked. End of story. The Scripture tells me that true brethren are to bear one another up, not tear one another up. We are to bear one another's burdens. False brethren love it when true brethren sin. I did have a joke about false brethren, but I missed it. False brethren are not those who used to be cistern. I got one laugh. <laughs> Watch out. I'm going to tell about the ants. But false brethren love it when true brethren sin. False brethren love to stir the pot, but they never feed anybody. False brethren love to find fault, but never want to help anyone out of their fault. They never want to teach anyone out of their fault. They never want to be compassionate to that person who has been found in fault. They just want to find it. They love to say that they love. But their father is the father of lies. And our father is the father of light. And that's how you tell the difference. The truth is not in them. And if you just hang around a while, a false brethren will be betrayed by their own words. If you have discernment, great. If you don't, pray for it. But always listen to what they say. Because they have the spirit of Antichrist. One thing I have learned about demons, demons do what demons do. The scripture tells me that Satan cannot tell the truth. The truth is not in him. 
Now, he can quote Scripture. You say, well, how can he quote Scripture and not be telling the truth? It's because he adds his own twist. And any half-truth is fully a lie. And so he can quote scriptures and be lying at the same time. So it's very difficult. We must separate ourselves. These folks, I, you know, I believe that demons are a whole lot like vampires. You know, they want to come in. You need, first of all, you have to invite them in. And then they'll suck the life out of you. Next thing you know, the demon that they got, you got. And so we have to know how to discern them and find them. I'd like to have some garlic out in the, out in the vestibule area. They'd probably come in the back door, you know. But... Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. You know, we've all come out of slavery. We're all just sinners saved by grace. We've all come out of darkness. We were not born in light. We have come out of darkness. Can you put that up there for me? Look it up. It's uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What is a yoke? A yoke is basically a piece of wood that ties us together. Well, you have two oxen or two mules together, or in, the, in, in Leviticus, it'll teach you, in, in uh, Levitical times, the Hebrews were not allowed to have a, a yoke of an oxen and of an ass at the same time. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship, what fellowship, hath righteousness with unrighteousness. It doesn't say sinners. It says unrighteousness. And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And you say, well, why would an infidel come to church? Oh, that's their favorite place. Light has nothing to do with darkness. I'll answer the question that light has nothing to do with the darkness. Don't be tied up with anyone who exhibits division in these things. Beware of them. You know, a real brother builds one another up. You'll know them by their actions, not by their words. I'm looking at people here all over this room that would do anything in the world for any other one of you within their power. They would do anything in the world for you. You know your true brethren by their actions. All right. The... Uh, I want to tell you something, though, about demonic people. Once you figure out who they are, don't let them touch you. Don't let them touch anything you own. Don't let them in your house. Don't let them talk to your children. You must shun those people because that attachment, that demon is looking to attach to somebody else. 
And if you have felt depression come out of absolutely nowhere, you may have been entertaining not angels, but demons. Luke chapter 12, and I'm almost done. Verse 50, and I'm going to shock your socks off here toward the end. I'm, I'm, I'm about to. I'm not a golfer, but I'm about to make a hole in one and prove everything that I've said. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you no, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five and one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter. You get the idea. And the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I bet that's pretty easy to do, except for my mom and my, my wife. They get along great. He said that I have not come. You know, everybody on the airwaves will tell you that Christ has come to bring unity. He himself said, I did not come to bring unity. I have come to bring division. It is natural, and I'm going to prove it to you. The first thing in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. And immediately after he created the light, he separated it from the darkness. He divided the light and the dark immediately. That was the first thing that was ever recorded that God said. Let there be light, and then he divided it. And I will tell you, if the Holy Ghost is shining light in your life, you need to be divided from the darkness. It is only natural. We are the church of the living God. We have a huge target on our chest. We must always be aware of the wolves in sheep's clothing. Scripture tells us to come out from among them and be separate. Be ye separated. You come out from among them and be ye separate. And that is talking about sin. That is talking about all of it. But I'll tell you what. The irony of it is and I want you to please stand with me. I haven't seen anybody shouting the victory tonight. Haven't seen anybody just getting a big blessing, but you are getting a big blessing up here. You may not have the foggiest clue what I'm talking about, and if you don't, it's you I'm talking to. But here is, here is the, the punchline that the church of God cannot be completely uni unified until it is divided. Until we divide ourselves away from the hypocrites, from the wolves in sheep's clothing that creep in and they're acting like the real thing. We need to be as wise as serpents harmless as doves, but we are to be separate. So, I don't want this to start any division other than the vision that needs to take place. And I'll tell you what, if you are a hypocrite, if you are someone who shakes your brother's hand and then goes home on Facebook or whatever, Twitter, whatever else tears them down, that's you. You may be influenced by demons and not even know it. I will tell you, if you're doing that, that's you. If you are tearing down the ministry, if you are tearing down your brother and your sister, then you are an actor. You are a hypocrite. And you need to get on your knees and repent. Because there's one day, you know what? The wheat and the tares, one day the master is going to pull up those tares and throw them in the fire. There's one day that he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. So all of us need to be careful. We need to help one another.
We don't need to be hypocrites. We need to be the real deal. We need to love one another with our actions. James said, I'll tell you what, you know, you can, you can say, you can talk a good game, but unless you have some works, you're just a sounding brass. We need to add the love of God and the true unity of the body of Christ to the brethren and the sisters. Amen? Amen. A little bit strange tonight, I know. Lesson in demonology. But we need to know them. We need to know them. I, I would dare say that most of you will probably never be approached by a demon that is not walking around in somebody's body. And so we need to know them. Amen. Father in heaven, we love you tonight. I pray, Lord God, that you would grant us wisdom, that you would grant us discernment, and that you would grant us unity and division, that you would grant us the wisdom to divide, the wisdom to judge, the wisdom to know our brothers and to know who are false brothers so that we can separate ourselves, so that we can carry out that, that task that you have given us, the calling that you have put upon this church so that you can accomplish what is set out, what you have set out to do in our lives and in this church and in this community. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I hope to see you all on Sunday.